I invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, as we continue to look at the life of Jesus, a look that I trust is changing us. Mark chapter 10 this morning, we'll be zeroed in on verses 17 through 22. Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 22. This is God's word, beginning in verse 17. And as he, Jesus, was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said, teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing, go, sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Let's pray. Jesus, these are weighty words. You know my heart, I'm fearful that I'll I'll mess this up. Lord, we are needy people that need to hear from you, not from me. And so we're just going to trust right now that your word is true. You've called men like me all over the globe to preach your word. So Lord, I'm going to preach your word. I pray that you'd help me to leave out anything that isn't helpful, that is wrong. And Lord, that you would build up your people, that you'd strengthen your church, and that you would call men and women to yourself. We are utterly dependent upon you now. We're painfully aware of that. Amen. Have you ever made a, a bad choice, a wrong decision? You know, I can't tell you how many times I've had buyer's remorse where you walk into a store and you buy one thing and then a couple of days later, oh man, I should have bought that other thing. I almost made the right choice. This morning's sermon is entitled, Almost. When we use that word almost in a negative sense, it can communicate some of life's greatest disappointments, regrets. I almost bought $10,000 worth of Apple stock 20 years ago. Not really, but I almost did. But instead, I decided to spend that $10,000 on a used Chevy. Today, the Chevy is dead. And that $10,000 worth of Apple stock is worth $6.62 million. I almost became a millionaire. I almost went on a diet. <laughs> I almost decided to start exercising a few years back with my friend. Now today my friend is fit as a fiddle. Well, I have a hard time making up my basement steps. I almost made the decision to get healthy. 
You see, almost, it's, it's a word that we use to express regret. The man in our story today, he almost followed Jesus. Almost. But rather than, than putting down what he thought was going to make him happy, rather than putting down the things he's been chasing after and clinging to Jesus, he chose instead to just not make any changes, to just stay on course, to stay comfortable, safe, hellbound. You see, he passed up on, on the eternal treasure of Jesus Christ for the temporary treasures of this earth. And friend, that is a decision that cost him far more than passing up on some apple stock. He almost, man, he was so close. He almost fully surrendered to Jesus. But in the end, he just stayed his course. A decision I bet he regretted. Here's the thing about Richie. You don't mind if I call this guy Richie, do you? Richie is not his name, his real name. We don't know what his real name is, so I've nicknamed him Richie. Here's the thing about Richie. Richie is a good guy. Verse 21 tells us he's lovable. Verse 20 lets us know that he's religious. Verse 22 tells us he's wealthy. In other words, Richie's one of those guys you'd probably really like to just hang out and call your friend. Better yet, Richie's one of those guys you really hope your daughter can find someday and marry. He treats people right. He obeys God's commands. And he is financially set. I mean, think about it. Richie certainly seems like a better prospect for your daughter than some unemployed fisherman trekking around Israel with his 12 best friends. But for some reason, the story ends with Jesus choosing to be with the unemployed fisherman walking behind him. Then the rich moral man bowing before him. Let's take a look at Richie. Point number one is called Richie and me. Richie and me. Look, as we move through this text, if we don't see a little bit of Richie in us, then we're going to miss the whole point of why God included this event in his book. That's why point number one is Richie and me. Look at verse 17. It says, and as he, that's Jesus, was setting out on his journey. Let me remind you, because it's been a few weeks since we got caught up to, no, not weeks, months, since we got on, caught up to where Jesus is. Believe it or not, we are nearing the end of Jesus' earthly life in our life-changing look. And you may, remain, may or may not remember that Jesus has now left his ministry headquarters up in Capernaum near the Sea of Galilee. He's done ministering up there in the northern part of Israel, southern part of Lebanon, and he is indirectly working his way down to Jerusalem to die. So as he sets out on his death march, Verse 17 tells us there's a man, that's Richie. 
In verse 22, we're told that he's got a lot of stuff. He's rich. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 20, we're told that he's young. In Luke chapter 18 and verse 18, we're, he's called a ruler. That's why Richie is often referred to as the rich, young ruler. So Richie, he runs up and he kneels down before Jesus and he asks him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I love this guy. He seems to be doing everything right. He's literally doing what I often call you to do at the end of a message. He's running to Jesus. And when he gets there, what he, what's he do? He falls to his knees in front of Christ. He pays homage to Jesus. He humbles himself and he exalts Christ. And then he calls Jesus good. What? To call somebody good in this culture, at this time in Israel? Man, that was a word that was reserved only for God. Nobody called somebody else good. And then he asked Jesus the perfect setup question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? From my perspective, from a, from a pastoral perspective, Richie does everything right. You talk about a prospect for the church. His attitude is right. His approach is right. His question is right. Billy Graham once said of Richie, he said, the man came to the right teacher with the right question and received the right answer. And yet he made the wrong decision. I'm going to allow myself to get a little bit ahead of the sermon here for a moment. What's so alarming and disturbing about Richie is he has so many things right, but he has one major thing wrong. Richie, he reminds me so much of myself. He reminds me so much of many of us. Good people, moral people. He's better off financially. We're better off financially than 75% of the world. Spiritual people, people who are obedient to God's commands. Theological people, people who look and can play the part of someone running after Jesus, falling down in front of Jesus, in front of a lot of people, but missing the point entirely. I'd wager to say that a lot of pastors in America have no idea what to do with this text. Because it nails us to the wall. He has trouble, Richie does, laying down his commitment to obeying God, clinging to his right profession, even seeing, perhaps calling Jesus God. But yet, he allows all these really good things, these almost things, to come in and usurp Jesus. 
It's all about Jesus. I'm left wondering, how, how many riches have come forward at the end of a church service? Have bowed down in front of an altar like Richie bows down in front of Jesus? Asks the similar question to Richie. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Is told to, to pray a prayer of salvation. Is then given assurance of salvation. But yet, they never lay down and walk away from their idols. They never free up their vice grip on their desires to want to be so pleasing or to be so pleased. They never surrender their lives to follow Jesus to Calvary. They're never crucified with Christ. And now the life they live they do not live for him. Christ surely is a part of their life. But they do not live for him. The Apostle Paul tells us in Galatians 2.20 that I have been crucified. Crucified with Christ. And I no longer live but Christ lives in me. And the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who died and gave himself for me. Christian, here's a tough question for you to consider. Would Jesus live your life the way you're living it? Are you living the crucified life? If Jesus were somehow to come down from heaven, invade your skin, have the same family as you, the same job as you, the same bank account as you, the same hobbies as you, what would be different? Would your life even be recognizable? You see, here's the thing. I think for most of us, if we're being honest, we would say my life would look completely different. And yet, we tell ourselves we're following after him. You see, if Jesus lived Richie's life. I have a feeling he would have sold all of Richie's stuff, given it to the poor. Why can I say that? Because that's exactly what Jesus did when he left the glories of heaven, came and humbled himself taking on the form of a servant, dying on a cross. Why? So that we could know him and he could give us his eternal inheritance. First Peter 1. It's exactly what Jesus did. Salvation is undoubtedly by grace, meaning you cannot earn it. This is where the tension of this passage comes together. It is by grace, through faith, in Jesus Christ alone. No one can work the way to heaven. No one can sell their stuff enough to make it to heaven. No one can give away their stuff enough to make it to heaven. However, if this account teaches us anything, it's that faith in Jesus, when you come to place your life on the altar of self-sacrifice and you give it to Jesus out of faith, well, that faith produces a remarkably transformed human being that walks after Jesus. Jesus. 
This is why point number one is called Richie and Me. I've got to ask myself, how much Richie is there in me? Am I playing games? When I run to Jesus, when I fall down to Jesus, am I trying to fool Jesus? Am I talking all about Jesus while behind my back holding on to my idols? Richie and me, point number two, moralistic deism is no substitute for following Jesus. Point number two, moralistic deism is no substitute for following Jesus. In other words, being a moral man or woman who believes in God is no substitute for following Jesus. Verse 18, and Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Listen, Richie, Richie's either a fool or he is a theologian. Why might Richie be a fool? Because no one called another human being good at this time. I've already said that earlier in the sermon. Not even a really good teacher. Leon Morris, he's a commentator that I respect. He wrote a commentary on the book of Mark. And in that commentary on this passage, he says that there are absolutely zero examples in Jewish writings of a teacher being called good. That's because this word, this adjective, it's only used of God. Only God is good. So don't be a fool, Richie. What are you doing calling another guy good? Here's the thing. I don't think Richie's a fool at all. I think he knows exactly what he's doing. As we'll see in the next few verses, Richie, Richie is very aware of God. And he's very aware of God's word, his commandments. You see, Richie is a deist. He believes in God. And Richie, as a result of his belief in God, is a moral man. He's following the Ten Commandments. And so, as this deistic, moralistic man, he's very aware of the Jewish tradition of the nation in which he's living in that did not allow one man to call another man good. No one's good except God alone. But Richie calls Jesus good. Why? Why, Richie? Because he suspects that Jesus is God. Richie's no fool. He's a man that's devoted his life to God and following his commandments. He's a theologian. He suspects that the man that he now falls, finds himself in front of on his knees is God. Verse 19, you know the commandments. This is Jesus talking now. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Don't defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. Oh, church. This, this interaction it's fascinating and confusing and dumbfounding all at once. This man asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responds without giving him the gospel. Jesus, if he's in evangelism 101 at Moody Bible Institute, like I was a long time ago, he just failed the exam. He gives the wrong answer. By the way, that's a judgment on my class, not Jesus. Sorry, Moody, I love you. 
Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Cornerstone has a championship church softball team, so here's an illustration you all will understand. Richie, he takes a big fat softball and he lobs it at Jesus who's standing at the plate. It's a softball that any of y'all could sit there and connect with and send it flying over the fence so that Team Heaven could score a run. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, the obvious answer is repent. Turn from your unbelief, turn from your sin, and turn to Jesus. Believe, trust in Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior. Do you believe that you're a sinner before a holy God? Oh, I, I know I am. Well, do you believe that Jesus died and rose again and also you could be forgiven of your sins and he could wash you clean and clothe you with his perfection? Yeah, I, 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 think, I, I think I believe that. Well, do you want to go to heaven and, and be with God forever? Well, of course. That's why I'm here. Well, then pray this prayer with me. Repeat after me. That's evangelism 101. But that's, that's not how this exchange between Jesus and Richie goes at all. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Excuse me, did you just call me good? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry about that. I Forget about that. I, I, I thought that maybe you were... Yes, can you just... I'm really curious about eternal life. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, you know the commandments. What? What? Jesus, why... Why didn't you tell him about the cross? You're on the way to the cross. Why, did, why didn't you tell him about substitutionary atonement? Why didn't you tell him that you would be his substitute on the cross and that you would pay for all of his sins and give you his perfection? Why, why didn't you tell him about grace, about salvation by grace through faith in you? That's not the message Richie hears at all. Don't murder. Don't cheat on your wife. Don't take stuff that doesn't belong to you. Don't lie. Don't cheat people out of their money. And be sure to give your mom and your dad some respect. Does Jesus' reply surprise you like it surprises me? Richie says, teacher, all of these I've kept since I was a little boy. Richie must be feeling pretty good at this point in the conversation. You see, it was very common for Jews at this point to believe that they could keep all of the Old Testament laws. You need to remember, Paul had not wrote, written Romans 3.23 yet, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. According to the re religious rabbis, the teacher, excuse me, teachers during the time of Christ, they taught that it was very possible for a person to keep all of the Old Testament law perfectly think about it it's not that hard not to kill somebody <laughs> it's not that hard to stay faithful to the woman you love it's not that hard to love your mom and dad and so Rich is here. He's just checking off the list. He's moral. He believes in God. He's a moralistic deist. But moralistic deism is no 
substitute for following Jesus. Verse 21. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Let me ask you something, church. Is following and obeying the Ten Commandments perfectly, is that what gets you into heaven? No. Does selling everything you have and giving it to the poor buy you a ticket into heaven? Well, you might be tempted to say yes after reading this, but the answer is no. Jesus, he lovingly looks at Richie. The picture that the Greek paints here is beautiful. He fixes his gaze on Richie. And then it says that he loves him. He locks eyes on him. And out of this heart, perfect love of Jesus, agape love, gospel love pouring out of him, he looks at him and he says, Richie, one thing you lack. You might have everything, Richie, but you lack one thing. Me. Richie, it's all about me. His arms, they're so full of good things. Living a moral life, that's a good thing. Loving mom and dad, that's a good thing. Being a man that's business-minded and being successful. There's no shame in that. He's so wrapped up with his good theology that can identify that Jesus is good. He's so wrapped up with his morals and his business pursuits. He's even wrapped up now with his pursuit of eternal life. And Jesus is able to look at him right in the face and out of love, tell him, those things aren't me. It's all about Christ. Friend, Jesus sees you. And he loves you enough to tell you that if you are making anything the main thing that is not him, you're off. And he loves you enough to sit here and tell you that if you feed your, your idols, rather feeding your relationship with Christ, you're off. He will not settle for second place, not because he's some sort of proud, arrogant man, but because he is better. And if he were to allow you to walk away and chase after other things, he would be feeding. He would be allowing you to commit adultery. And he says, like Rick, I'm not mad, but I'm telling you for the next time, <laughs> knock it off. Jesus knows more than anybody that he's better than everything in every way. And I'm telling you, church, because I've read about it in his book. There's men like Paul who can say with integrity that he counts all things as loss compared to the greatness, the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, his Lord. Isn't that what you want? Isn't that what your heart that is so hungry and so desperate for fulfillment and joy to realize that it's only found in Christ. Even you good people, the riches of the world. Listen, heaven isn't granted for those who keep the commandment. Look at the thief on the cross. 
Nor is it earned by selling your stuff and giving your money to the poor or giving it to the church. Look at Ananias and Sapphira. They did that, kept a little back, died. Eternal life is gained through trusting, clinging, surrendering to Jesus Christ, the Lord. And in his love for us, he shows us that we will never follow him. We will never cling to him while we're so busy clinging to other things. Which brings us to point number three. Almost a Christian. Verse 22 says, disheartened, brokenhearted by the saying, Richie went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. That word sorrowful, it might be better translated depressed. This word Jesus actually uses literally of dark clouds from a storm rolling in. He walked away under the gloom of depression because he had great possessions that he was not willing to let go of. Look, I love a happy ending. I hate movies that end sad. This story ends sad. A man comes and asks Jesus how to have eternal life, and Jesus preaches the truth, and he walks away. The man does. This lovable, likable, moral, bowing man who was seen in public running after Jesus, he makes a really bad choice. Let me tell you something. It's better to be an unemployed fisherman following Jesus than an idolater bowing down in front of him. Don't run to him only to walk away from him. Crucify your idols, not your faith. Follow Jesus, no matter the cost, and you will find that he is truly better than everything in every way. Jeff, this message sounds so hard. This sounds like law. It sounds like Jesus. These are his words, not mine. And I don't want to lead anyone down the path of thinking that you can somehow earn or buy or sell your way into the kingdom. It's all about Seeing Jesus for who and what he is. And you don't need to see him perfectly, but you've got to trust him. You've got to take him at his word. And the one thing we've seen consistently as we've looked at our life-changing look at Jesus is there are people who get a good look at him and never get it who never drop their nets, who never make him first. 
And there are those that do. And Jesus, through his word, he is fixing his gaze on you this morning because he loves you and he's telling you, come and follow him. Let's pray. God, you've got to do it. We are men and women who are made up of flesh and blood. It's broken. It's sinful. It's fallen. Theologians even tell us it's totally depraved. So we are at your mercy. God, let us taste and see that you are good. Lord, I, whether that's by some miracle today and all of a sudden we no longer have appetites for the things we've been chasing after, or whether it's by the process of our life of suffering and learning one day after another that any time we put our trust in something else, it will leave us nothing but jaded and empty. But one how or another, oh God, May we know Jesus. May we know him now. And oh God, may we know him then. May we not play the fool that does run to him only to walk away from him later. May we not play the fool that bows before him one moment and then proudly does his own thing the next. Oh Jesus, help us to find you sweet. Keep us close. We don't trust ourselves as we leave this place to remember. We need you to work. So, oh God, keep us from idolatry. Keep us close to Christ. By the power of your spirit. Amen.